we're going to wait another uh, five minutes or so to start. There's a, there's a lot of people registering outside, so rather than have them walk in in the middle, uh, we'll give them another five minutes. Thanks. Good morning. My name is Ted Griswack, and I'm the president of the New Buffalo Shoreline Alliance. I'd like to thank you for taking time out of your holiday weekend to be here with us today. The Alliance was formed to find and fund a means of preserving and protecting the beaches and shoreline of Lake Michigan and the southwest communities of New Buffalo, New Buffalo Township, Grand Beach, and Michiana Shores. Our board is made up of the following members, and I'd ask them to stand as their names are called. Joe Galetto, Vice President from Warwick Shores. Mark Schulte, Treasurer from Forest Beach Villas. Mike Misk, Secretary from Forest Beach Estates. And the following are board members at large. Ed Oldis, Sunset Shores. Ron Watson, Sunset Shores. Jim Cash, Warwick Shores. Jim Carson, Warwick Shores. Doug Vanderlyn, Forest Beach Estates. Brian Burns, Grand Beach. Cindy Denning, Grand Beach. And our newest member, Ken Purs from Michiana Shores. I would also like to thank Ezra Scott, Township Committeeman, for being present today. Michelle Height would have been here to join us, except she's out celebrating her daughter's wedding. The MBSA is a 501c3 not-for-profit corporation. $15,000 has been contributed by affected homeowners associations and individuals, and an additional $14,000 from seven individuals has been contributed. These individuals are officers and active members of the organization. Expenses for legal opinions, engineering studies, and, and organizing expenses have been paid from these funds. There will be an ongoing need to fund the NBSA. At this time, I'd like to ask Ed Olis to speak on the history of the harbor and the actions to date taken by the Alliance. Ed. Thanks, Ted. Good morning. Uh, my name is Ed Olis. If you attended the May 27th meeting, some of what follows may be familiar. My wife and I bought a home in New Buffalo, Michigan in uh, 1982. I became involved in looking for a solution to the beach problem the day after the Halloween storm in 2014. You might remember that that storm produced the second highest waves ever re recorded by a weather buoy in Lake Michigan. This happens to be a picture of the breakwater in Benton Harbor. As we know, the waves can be very damaging. This is some of the damage in New Buffalo from that storm. This is in the Sunset Shore community. We know millions have been spent by property owners and homeowner associations to combat this problem. And we know that property values have been affected negatively. Uh, property values in communities south of the harbor have been reduced, in some cases, 30%. In 2009, the United States Army Corps of Engineers published a study which was an 85-page engineering report that was very detailed. It covered the shoreline dynamics from Grand Beach to just north of the harbor, and some of the data went back to 1857. It was a very, very thorough engineering report, and we owe a thank you to those individuals and groups that's, that stepped up to finance it. The other communities covered were Forest Beach, Warwick, and Sunset Shores. I have included the last two slides because some people believe that the problem relates to people building too close to the water. And I wanted to show that homes in Grand Beach and Sunset Shores were built long before the harbor and that these communities enjoyed great beaches. Beaches in this area of Lake Michigan often were 200 feet wide. This is another picture of the shoreline prior to the harbor being built. The original design documents for the harbor were published in 1961. A brief history of the harbor. It was authorized in 1958 by Congress, 
and was paid for by federal, state, and local monies. This is how the mouth of the uh, river looked prior to breakwater construction. For the harbor to be constructed, the Corps needed a place to pile sand, and they also needed a place to put future dredging material and beach nourishment material. They needed an easement from 39 homeowners in Sunset Shore, south of the harbor, to accomplish this. Homeowners were well aware of the erosion problem caused by the, to the shoreline and property south of the St. Joe bro breakwater, and all of them refused to give an easement. So in 1967, the city filed suit against 39 homeowners for an easement. The suit was later reduced to 37 homeowners. Some of the more interesting findings showed that the attorney for the city claimed that by building the harbor, it was an insurance policy against future erosion. The deposition of the engineer who designed the harbor was also revealing. In his deposition, he acknowledged that 100,000 cubic yards of sand were transported by, by the littoral drift past New Buffalo each year. That the harbor would not be a complete barrier to the littoral drift, that sand would go around the end of the harbor, and some would eventually return to shore, but probably not for two or three miles southwest of the harbor. Let me repeat that. That the harbor would not be a complete barrier to this littoral drift, that sand would go around the end of the harbor, and some would eventually return to shore, but probably not for two or three miles southwest of the harbor. From the harbor south, we have the communities of Sunset Shore, Warwick Shores, Forest Beach, and Grand Beach. Three miles from the harbor is about where the steel seawall juts out of the lake at Grand Beach. From the harbor to Grand Beach is the dead zone. And this is the exact area where all the damage is concentrated. He also knew that erosion would be caused by the structure and that beaches may need 100,000 cubic yards of sand a year. He also claimed that if erosion occurred, the core would furnish sand at periodic intervals. The trial, which was started in 1967, was finally settled in 1969 after all appeals were exhausted. The city won an easement to all that property, and the homeowners were given a modest compensation for this easement. Most were in the area of $3,000. And the Corps did provide beach nourishment for 20 years to offset the erosion. From 1975 through 1995, they dumped almost a million cubic yards of sand on the beach south of the harbor. But in 1995, they stopped. They claimed they ran out of money. Going through the records, one finds beach erosion a continuing problem. Many letters are written by the city and homeowners trying to get some relief from the erosion caused by the harbor. Without a beach nourishment program, the, f the sand finally moves away. Getting back to the United States Army Corps of Engineers 2009 study, the objective of the study was to define sediment management techniques that will enhance littoral supplies to the region. The intent of the re report is to be a coastal solution guide for the village of Grand Beach. Utilizing findings from the study will allow the village and homeowner association to pursue effective coastal engineering solutions that will benefit all entitlees in the region. The conclusion of this study will be a basis of future engineering efforts. One of the focuses of the 2009 study was the shoreline. Here in this slide, you see a comparison between the shoreline in 1973, that's to the, the left, and, 19, and 2005. The study reported that the greatest loss of shoreline was in the Sunset Shore area. One might expect that since Sunset Shore is closest to the breakwater. In the core study, the loss of beach in the Warwick Shores area from 1980 through 2002 was minus 1.614 feet per year. In this graphic, the shoreline of Warwick Shore 
in Forest Beach are shown. Each color represents a, a, a year of the shoreline. So the, the farther shoreline was in this depiction was 1967, and the, the least amount of shoreline was when this, the last data was collected for this, which, which is the red, which is 2005. This is their beach today. The Corps also studied the shoreline north of the harbor. In this graphic, you can see the growth of the shoreline over time. Again, using the same key, you look at 1967, and, but in this uh, a graph, the outermost line is the red line, and that's 2005. So the red line, the most outward line, is 2005. And in this, it's a little easier picture of the north and south sides of the harbor. This was also taken in 2005. And this is the difference today. In the original harbor design, it was thought that the area north of the harbor would stop sand and become full in five years. After five years, the sand would start to move around the breakwater. In the 2009 study, the Corps found that the North Fillet had 256,000 square feet in 1980 that the North Fillet did not become full within five years of completion and had grown over the last 30 years. The new study also predicted that the North Fillet, or north side of the breakwater, will continue to collect sand until 2020. They thought by then the Fillet would reach a surface area of about 1,722,000 square feet. Remember that back in 1980, it was only 256,000 square feet. The study found that the fillet is the size of 35 football fields. That's about two miles long by 160 feet wide. I want you to note the breakwater here. This is the shoreline uh, in 1919. 75 at the completion of the harbor. And this is at the shoreline of the breakwater today. The breakwater goes all the way back here. The start of the breakwater goes all the way back here. So in 2009, so in the 2009 85-page study, the court uh, looked at 25 different solutions. A wide array of nourishment locations and quantities were studied. A number of other engineering solutions were studied, including groins and offshore underwater breakwaters. The Corps concluded after looking at these solutions, the best solution for a long-term benefit to the shoreline would be a, to implement a beach nourishment program. By adding 120,000 cubic yards of beach nourishment, the beach would increase to a to 150 to 200 feet in width. Over time, the beach would erode and need periodic nourishment. Beaches downdrift of the nourishment area, Grand Beach and Forest Beach, would stabilize at 30 to 60 feet. These amounts are similar to the amounts used by the Corps between 1975 and 1995. The best solution for a long-term the best location, excuse me, for a long-term solution, according to the core study, was placing the sand in the Sunset Shores 21 feet of shoreline and Warwick's 1,500 feet of shoreline, as depicted. Could we go back one slide, please? As depicted by uh, this line right here. Congressman Upton and Senator Stantonauer wrote a joint letter to the Under Secretary of the Army asking for help to save the pump house and solve the erosion problem. The undersecretary responded and wrote that the project is now functioning as intended. Congressman Upton wrote another letter asking for the pump house to be protected and the undersecretary again 
responded that the structure was functioning as intended. Our group also looked at a legal remedy. We started with a list, a list of nine highly recommended firms. We conducted phone interviews with some, and a subcommittee of the Alliance visited and interviewed three firms. We also talked with attorneys out of state who were successful against the core. And we paid for two legal opinions that both concluded we would be more than likely successful with a suit against the core. They all said the suit against the core are lengthy, most average over 15 years, and they are expensive. We were given upfront cost estimates from $1 million to $3 million. We also learned of a successful project in South Carolina. In this situation, uh, much like that in New Buffalo, the Corps built a structure that caused the loss of the beach in Folly Island. When confronted, the Corps claimed they were not responsible for the loss of the beach. The local attorney representing the property owners realized that a fight with the Corps in court would take 15 years. To restore the beach, he changed strategies. He convinced the Corps to implement a shore protect protection project. He went from blaming the Corps to getting the Corps to be proactive and design a protection project. He worked with a local congressman to fund the pro project, and the results were the same. He got beach. Since the Corps study was published back in 2009, we thought it would be prudent to have it reviewed to see if their, their conclusions were still valid. In searching for an engineer, engineering firm, we interviewed and requested proposals for, from four firms, one from the East Coast, one from the Chicagoland area, and two from Michigan. We asked them to use the, the Corps 2009 study as a basis and update it with current knowledge and conditions. From this re review, we asked them to give us an updated plan to protect our shoreline. Based on their response, the New Buffalo Shoreline Alliance selected Edgewater Resources, a local Michigan firm familiar with our shoreline as well as state and federal regulatory personnel. In our judgment, the best to develop a plan. And here is their study. Water Resources is proud to present the New Buffalo Shoreline Alliance Conceptual Implementation Plan. In this presentation, we will walk you through a brief historical timeline of the New Buffalo Harbor Project and associated shorelines. We will then cover the current site conditions, followed by the Edgewater Resources recommendation and next steps for implementation. First, let's highlight key background information for the New Buffalo Harbor. Construction for what is now the New Buffalo Harbor location began in 1973 and was completed in 1975 by the Army Corps of Engineers. The harbor was maintained by the Army Corps for the next 20 years until 1995 when the maintenance stopped. Throughout the 20-year period, maintenance included dredging the harbor and placing the dredge material along the southern shoreline. This nourishment placement area that included the dredge material and locally sourced sand from quarries is depicted as a yellow rectangle on the aerial image shown here. In 1995, the Army Corps discontinued the harbor maintenance, leaving the city of New Buffalo responsible for costs associated with dredging the harbor. Since this time, the New Buffalo community has identified issues such as erosion and sand starvation, leading to concerns about the shoreline health. To address these concerns, the Army Corps of Engineers were contacted to assist. The Army Corps studied sediment drift patterns, wind and wave data, 
and other factors associated with the shoreline. They also tested several solutions to address sand starvation issues south of the harbor. As shown in the image provided, the Army Corps reported that the regional sediment drift flows from north to south along the shoreline. Structures in the harbor impede this flow, which redirects the sand, leaving a sand-starved southern shoreline. This is evident from the large beach area just north of the harbor. Sand is being caught north of the harbor as well as flowing past the southern shoreline. To solve these issues, the Army Corps recommended constructing 25 stone breakwaters from Sunset Shores to Grand Beach for $2.6 million. As seen in the graphic provided, these breakwaters would sit below the water surface and sand is captured behind the breakwater, creating a new and much wider beach. The recommendation stressed that the breakwaters must be charged with an initial sand nourishment of 75,000 cubic yards to provide stability to the system. In addition, a low-cost option was provided as a Phase 1 recommendation. This option would consist of an initial investment of 5 to 10 breakwaters near sunset shores and a recommendation to monitor the performance of these breakwaters for two years. Additional breakwaters would be added later depending on the performance. This year, Edgewater Resources performed an in-depth analysis of the work and recommendations provided by the 2010 Army Corps study. We have concluded that the project cost estimates, as stated by the Army Corps, are significantly lower than what should be expected for a project of this size. Also, conditions have changed since 2010, and the impact of these changes need to be addressed in order to provide the best strategy and solution moving forward. We will address these costs later in the presentation, but first, let's discuss recent site conditions along the New Buffalo shoreline. The first condition that we will discuss is the ever-changing Lake Michigan water levels. To illustrate the cyclic nature of the water levels, the following chart published by the Army Corps of Engineers shows record and historical water level data on a monthly basis. The red line indicates recorded water levels from 2015 to 2017, while also showing the blue dotted line that indicates historical monthly averages. As you can see, the water levels over the past three years are higher when compared to the historical monthly values. Also, we are almost one and a half feet above the historical average for the month of August. Water levels are showing a consistent upward trend from the all-time record low in January of 2013 to today. Lastly, it is concerning that the current higher water level trend could still increase towards the record all-time high water level experienced in 1986. Furthermore, the recent above average water levels can result in intense wave energy along the shoreline during storms. Storms, especially experienced during the fall, can devastate a shoreline that is not properly protected. A prime example of this is the 2014 Halloween storm that produced record high wave heights in the lake and caused property damage along not only the New Buffalo shoreline, but also surrounding communities. Examples of shoreline protection systems include armor stone revetments, steel sheeting, a combination of the two, and smaller riprap protection. These shoreline edges cascade up and down the project shoreline and will affect the sand conditions of the adjacent shorelines. In summary, incorporating shoreline protection measures such as these during these higher water conditions to prevent immediate shoreline erosion, but they also have an impact on adjacent shorelines. Careful consideration and design must be employed when addressing shoreline erosion on a larger scale as we are attempting in this project. Another item to consider when examining current conditions is lake bottom depths and sediment drift patterns. Since the Army Corps study was published in 2010, conditions within the lake, the near shore, and around the harbor structures have changed drastically, and these changes need to be quantified. Specifically, changes in the north fillet, the bypass bar, and the southern shoreline need to be characterized in order to fully understand and develop a viable strategy for addressing the sand starvation and erosion of the southern shoreline. 
In fact, the Army Corps provides yearly surveys of the navigation channel within the harbor to determine the current conditions and whether or not the project gold depths of 8 to 10 feet of water do in fact exist. As you can see on the 2016 survey exhibit shown here, the established federal navigation channel is fairly narrow throughout the harbor. Please note the red areas, which indicate shoaling or sand deposition within the channel and near the entrance of the harbor. We would also like to point out that shallow areas exist north and south of the channel within the limits of the harbor piers. Utilizing sand from these shallow areas as a beach nourishment source should be explored as this project moves forward. Before moving on to the conceptual implementation plan, we would like to highlight two main differences between the Army Corps study and recent site conditions. The first one is that the Army Corps stated that the North Fillet Beach area was projected to reach equilibrium or capacity in 2020. This equilibrium means that this area will no longer accept or trap sand, thus allowing the sand to migrate around the structures and along the southern shoreline. This is an important development when strategizing a solution to solve the sand starvation issues that exist. Second, the recent higher water level trend and resulting shoreline effects is a major development since the Army Corps study. This higher water level is playing a significant role in the shoreline erosion and sand starvation issues. The plan has been created to help assist it in moving forward on a strategy to address these issues. The goals of the conceptual implementation plan as proposed by Edgewater Resources include, first and foremost, protecting shoreline property and homes, protecting critical infrastructure such as the new Buffalo water intake and strategizing a way to address sand starvation issues south of the harbor. In order to achieve these goals, the conceptual implementation plan has several components or steps. These steps include an initial concept recommendation along with a cost estimate, planning and strategizing with stakeholders, preliminary engineering and design, permitting and processing with the state and federal agencies, and also funding opportunities will be explored. The plan agrees with the Army Corps study in that offshore breakwaters combined with beach nourishment are the best option for the communities south of the harbor. The initial recommendation is to construct 33 breakwaters from the Dunewood Condominium Association's property to the southern limits of Grand Beach. Also, this recommendation includes supplying the breakwater system with an initial beach nourishment of 250,000 cubic yards. In addition, a secondary beach nourishment of 400,000 cubic yards is recommended for the entire system shown in the concept graphic here. The sand required for the beach nourishment could be provided by hydraulically dredging it from the shallow areas from within the harbor. Identifying quantities and other sources of beach nourishment will be a task in the preliminary engineering phase, which will be described later. The plan's breakwater concept works in, this, in a similar fashion as the Army Corps Studies recommendation. This graphic shows that when the waves approach the breakwaters from various directions, the sand drops out in a fan-like shape, leaving a new beach area behind the structures. Of course, the size, direction, and placement location of these breakwaters will all play a role in the efficiency of the system. An example of an offshore breakwater system is located in Lake Forest, Illinois, which is just outside of Chicago. You'll note the protected beach area between the structures and the new beach area that is created over time behind the structures. Here is another example of an offshore breakwater system. Note the beach area that has formed landward of the breakwaters. In summary, there are plenty of examples throughout the Great Lakes and other parts of the country where these breakwaters do in fact exist and perform well. During this initial recommendation phase, two breakwater concepts were developed, Concept A and Concept B. Concept A is an above water concept, meaning that the crest of the breakwater is above the water level, while Concept B is a submerged system similar to the Army Corps study, 
where the crest is lower than the water elevation. The main difference between the two concepts is concept A requires more stone, thus increasing the costs. Please note that the initial beach nourishment volume of 250,000 cubic yards is recommended in both concepts shown here. The concept costs range from 42 million for the above water system to 12 million for the submerged system. We also recommend an additional or secondary cost item that includes the placement of 400,000 cubic yards of material behind the southernmost 20 structures, which is an additional $8 million. In addition to the construction costs previously presented, a soft cost estimate was developed to show other cost items that should be considered as part of the implementation plan. These soft costs include additional surveying and data collection of the lake and shoreline areas, preliminary and final engineering of the design, permit applications and processing, conducting special studies or providing coastal engineering as required by the agencies, funding assistance, and finally, construction oversight and administration. The total of these costs is $950,000. The next phase of the plan is to meet with stakeholders in the area to obtain interest, support, and feedback on the initial recommendation. The important stakeholders are the City of New Buffalo, Berrien County, Michigan DNR, Michigan Department of Environmental Quality, the Army Corps, and other local and or regional environmental groups. During the development of the plan, an initial discussion with the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality was pursued as to why offshore breakwaters do not yet exist in the Michigan waters of the Great Lakes. The DEQ stated that permitting these structures will require a detailed coastal engineering study and a bottomlands lease agreement from the state. Since these structures have not been permitted in the past, the bar will be set fairly high to show that other construction alternatives will not work for the project. The Army Corps recognizes the fact that sand starvation is prevalent throughout the Southwest Michigan area and they should be included in future discussions as the plan moves forward. Preliminary engineering is an important phase of the plan and includes gathering additional site data, collecting current bathymetric data of the lake, updating the wind and wave information, identifying sources of beach nourishment, updating the littoral drift study, and assessing the sand bypass bar. The preliminary engineering phase will further the initial recommendation presented earlier and ultimately develop a plan to capture sand along the bypass bar out in the lake. During the planning and preliminary engineering phase, alternative breakwater construction means and methods will be explored. One such alternative material is called reef balls, which are concrete ball-like shapes with holes throughout as shown in the picture. Alternative materials and or shapes such as these concrete structures provide fish habitat value for the project and may attract interest within the environmental sector. One major hurdle in the implementation plan is identifying and capturing funds to pay for the project. For example, a sandbank option, as identified in the Army Corps study, involves pooling funds from homeowners along the lake to assist in funding the project. Other funding opportunities include grants such as the Coastal Zone Management Grant or the FEMA Pre-Disaster Mitigation Grant. The FEMA grant is available to assist to implement and sustain cost-effective measures designed to reduce the risk to individuals and properties from natural hazards. This grant opportunity was recently released and $90 million is available. The New Buffalo Harbor communities are planning to submit a FEMA grant application in time for the November 2017 deadline. Finally, to move the plan forward, we propose the following steps. First, Meeting with critical stakeholders will provide valuable feedback and gain support for the recommended plan. Discussing sandbank options with homeowners to develop a way to fund a portion of the project should occur in the next three to six months. 
Engaging with agencies in the next three months on the recommended plan will provide a strong foot to step forward with. Lastly, strategizing a plan to apply for the FEMA grant that is due in November of 2017 should occur immediately. This concludes our presentation on the conceptual implementation plan for the New Buffalo Shoreline Alliance. Thank you for your Your attention. <laughs> we have two paths forward to fund this project. One path is through FEMA and one path is through the White House. I'm going to discuss the FEMA path and Ezra Scott, our county commissioner, will discuss the White House path. Better? FEMA has a pre-disaster mitigation program. Under this program, they spend money on projects that prevent or protect property before disaster happens. This year, $90 million have been approved by Congress. The program works like this. The township city makes a detailed application to the state of Michigan hazardous, Hazard Mitigation Office on our project. The state can only pick nine to send on to the federal government. Generally, the project with the best cost-benefit ratio moves on. Once at the federal level, the applicants from Michigan compete against all other state applicants. The maximum award is $3 million, and again, the federal government is looking for the best return on their investment. The state application had to be in yesterday, and the state must send their winners in by November the 14th. The winners are announced in December, and the money is awarded in January. We have submitted our application. I'd now like to ask Ezra Scott to come up and speak regarding his trip to the White House and other funding options. Ezra. How are you today? I'm a lifelong resident. My name is Ezra Scott. I'm a newly elected county commissioner for the 9th District, which is New Buffalo. Um, I guess I'm not a politician, so I don't act like one. So when I got invited to the White House, uh, along with other Michigan County Commissioners on August 8th, I acted like I usually do, and I just talked to everybody. Um, I spoke to Adam Killian, who's the director of FEMA. I gave him some information. Um, this was in the uh, Eisenhower building in the uh, White House briefing room. And he says, uh, I'll get back to you. I'm like, yeah, okay, cool. Well, about 15 minutes later, my phone goes off. Um, he's emailing me. He wants more information. Um, probably 14 emails have gone back and forth between the director of FEMA and myself. Um, I've let Lou... Uh, no, the mayor and Michelle, and also Joel, who's the state FEMA director who has to actually fill out the application. The city of New Buffalo and the township, along with uh, the village of Grand Beach and Michigan, all passed resolutions uh, to apply for this grant. Um, and I believe that grant has been completed, correct? The NOI has been completed. Yeah, the NOI has been completed. Um, I got the nine or 11 pages on my phone the other day from Michelle. So um, we're working that route also. Um, I spoke with a man uh, whose name is Justin Clark. He's the executive director of intergovernmental affairs for the White House. Uh, turns out he's a top aide to the president. Uh, I gave him the email that uh, Ed Oldis sent to me on uh, the six page, five or six page of uh, uh, the Army Corps deposition where it said, yes, we know that when we put the harbor in, it's going to stop the littoral flow of sand uh, to the south and southwest, and we're basically gonna mitigate that by doing shoreline, pumping sand back onto the shoreline. Well, that seemed to work until they decided not to do anything more in 1995, um, and uh, they ran out of money. So I gave that to Justin, um, 
And uh, that was about all I did. About an hour and a half later, we're in the Indian Treaty Room, and I'm um, speaking to a couple other commissioners from the other from other counties in the state. And uh, somebody puts her hand on my shoulder, and it's Justin. He says, "Can we talk out in the hallway?" And I said, "Yes." He said, "The White House has absolutely no idea what you're talking about." And I said, "Well." He says, I want you to send me everything that you have and email it to me. I said, not possible, which I believe is now possible. It is possible, it is possible now. Um, 300 pages. So he gives me the address to send it to. And uh, I'm like, OK. He said, I need it by. Next Thursday, he said it'll be on the president's desk. I went, OK. Um, so I did what uh, the man told me to do. And um, lo and behold, uh, he got it. And um, I got an email from him afterwards stating that he got it and uh, that he'll be discussing it uh, with the president, who he said will probably call in the Department of Defense uh, that the Army Corps is under the Department of Defense, and uh, they'll look into this. I said, okay. Well, since or right before that happened, I mailed that out on a Wednesday so he could have it overnight by the Thursday morning. And um, on Monday, prior to that Thursday, I'm getting phone calls on my cell phone, and it's 202 area code, which says underneath it, Washington, D.C., I spoke to uh, the EPA. The EPA had questions. They wanted to find out how many gallons of water the pump house pumped uh, a day and how many customers it served. So I gave them that information. The next phone call I received was from the Department of the Interior. And they only had one question. That was a yes or no. They wanted to know whether or not that pump house supplied water to the Indian Casino, to the Pokagans. She said, yes, it does. Thank you very much, sir. Have a nice day. <laughs> then I received the strangest phone call that I've ever received is I got a phone call from Cy, and she's an administrative assistant to the director of NASA. I answered their questions. They, NASA wanted to know what month and year the break wall was completed. I said November of 1975. They said, thank you very much. I said, can I ask why NASA wants to know that? Our satellites fly over every day, sir, and we can actually tell you from day to day how much sand has come and gone from the shorelines. I was like, oh, cool. <laughs> Big brother. Um, it turned out that all three departments told me, now this was prior to Justin receiving his 300-page document. Uh, Justin had evidently contacted these agencies in the federal government and asked them to call me to get this information so that they could supply a report to supplant this 300-page report that was going to the President of the United States. I said, okay. I have no idea where this is going to go, but I can tell you I just happened to be in the right place at the right time, and I didn't care who I talked to about it, and I just talked to them like we're everyday people. And it turned out that these people have taken an interest in it, and we'll see where it goes. I did explain to Justin, though, I said that this deal with the Army Corps where they don't have any money, he said they've got money. <laughs> and and. You know, I you hear this, and you're just. I said, but here's here's the problem, Justin. I says we're applying for this FEMA grant also, and he goes, oh yeah, the pre-mitigation, you should. I said, okay. I says, but the pre-mitigation grant says that 75 percent is what FEMA will give, and the other 25 percent has to be made up from the local municipalities, such as the township, the city, the county, and then the state. I said, why do we have to pay 25% of the Army Corps' problem? 
I said, let's let, let's apply. He said, apply, we're going to do from both of them. And he says, what kind of money are we talking about here? I said, eh, maybe $20, 30000000 million, I believe. Because I hadn't seen the full report either. I'm just going by what I was told. Uh, while, while emails that I was getting from <laughs> you guys while I was in Washington. And um, he said, okay. And I said, what you have to understand is that if that's the case, whatever money we get, I said, you know, the Army Corps should pick up that other 25%. Taxpayers shouldn't have to pick that up. I mean, this is their problem. You saw it. They admitted it. You know, he said, apply for both of them. I said, okay. He said, how much, how much property does this affect? I said, between a quarter and a half a billion dollars worth of property values. Now I got his attention. Something I didn't know, and most of the clerks and the treasurers in the county did not know this either. Um, he advised me, Justin advised me, that uh, the federal government gets 6% of your property taxes. I had no idea. None. So now we're taking 6% of a half a billion dollars of property tax loss because if all of those homes are gone, that's lost revenue because, you know, it's amazing. They build break walls. They build things from raw materials, but one thing they're not producing anymore is dirt. And once it's gone, it's gone. Now, I will be honest with you. Your beaches are there. You just can't see them. And that's what I told Justin. I said, they're there. I said, it, it, I'm just a common sense person. I said, Justin, why can't we just take and get dredges out there and pump it all back out? He goes, well, send this in. He says, we'll have the, we'll have the president take a look at this and, and see. So, um, I, I did write him this letter that went with that. I'd like to read it to you. Um, oh, it was kind of interesting, too, because I got an a, a email back from uh, Billy Kirkland, who is the deputy underneath Justin, and he said that uh, do not mail it to the address Justin gave you because uh, he won't get it for eight days because that's has to go some screening process. So he had me send it to a different address. Uh, so that he got it the same day. Uh, this letter and binder of documents which, you request, which he requested is in response to our conversation at the Michigan County Commissioner's Conference on August 8th. Please note this binder of documents is also in the process of being digitized and the later date can be sent to you via email and flash drive. This is a very serious issue with imminent danger and potential loss of property and homes valued between 250 to $500 million. As these documents indicate, the Army Corps, which built and installed the harbor break wall, knew there was a problem and provided shoreline renourishment. However, that shoreline renourishment was started after 1975 and ended in 1995 due to the Army Corps stating there was no money to continue. Per all the information provided in this in-depth binder, you can see the serious condition and issues in this area. I would like to thank you in advance for all your efforts to resolve this imminent danger injury, imminent danger issue. As a newly elected Republican commissioner elected in November 2016, I thought I'd throw that in there, you know. <laughs> it is my, well, you gotta, you gotta work the system, people, you know. That's the way I think you have to, you know, I just talk. Uh, effective in November 2016 is my intention to address my constituents and their concerns with common sense and positive resolution to the shoreline issues caused by the Army Corps. I'm looking forward to working with you on this issue in an expedient manner. Please feel free to contact me at any time. Um, and since that time, I've been in contact with Justin, um, and everything seems to be going the way it should, I guess. I don't know. I've never done this before. Uh, but you have to understand that due to the uh, developments of what happened with Harvey, I think that takes a higher precedent than our issue, even though it's still issue. Um, so we just have to be a little patient. Uh, but I was very lucky to be in a situation where I talked to the right people, and uh, I got this uh, at least to the president's desk. Otherwise, I think it would have been laying on somebody's desk for, you know, up to a year. So uh, let's just wait and see how this all goes. Um, but there could possibly be, uh, you know, some money coming out of this. Uh, and I just say let's work every angle. Um, I know Senator Prose uh, just wrote a letter 
uh, in support of this, and um, uh, that's about it. I don't know if anybody had any questions, they could probably talk to me afterwards, uh, but uh, all I'm trying to do is help. Thank you. Ezra, thank you for your time today and your efforts. Over the past two years, we've explored the political, legal, and private options for a solution to the continuing destruction of our beaches. The work has been funded by the board, members of our group, and in an amount of approaching $30,000. Our problem is large, ongoing, and one that is leaving the shoreline with many condemned properties. We need money to begin the work that is needed for engineering. Our estimates indicate that at least $50,000 is needed short term to get this project off the ground and show those in government that the residents of Southwest Michigan are willing to assist if necessary in funding our effort. In addition, our ability to get some of the engineering work completed expeditiously would put us significantly ahead of other applicants for the FEMA grant. We need your help. As you can see from the cost estimates from Edgewood and Edgewater Engineering, this is an expensive undertaking. We need 50000 now to start. We are asking everyone, if possible, to donate $750. We, of course, will be happy to accept amounts in a lesser or greater amount. The money we have, the more money we have, the more engineering work, engineering work we can get done, and the less often we have to come back and ask this interested group for more money. You can write us a check pay by credit card, or sign a pledge card. It's not easy to ask for money, but we believe this is a good investment for our community. I thank you for your attention. I thank you for your time on a holiday weekend. Uh, the floor is open for questions if anybody has them. Yes. Remember, we are a 501c3. Tax deductible. Go ahead, uh, right there. The FEMA portion we know will be awarded uh, by January. So we, we, we sent in our notice of intent this week. Uh, the final application has to go in by the 14th of November and the award comes out mid-January. So we'll know that piece there. Uh, Edgewater, it's a small piece, it's a small piece. Uh, with regard to the White House, I think that's pretty much right now in, in their hands. It, it could be a month, it could be six months. Uh, we, though, need to keep going on the engineering side to get ahead of everybody. Edgewater is preparing a, a preliminary $50,000 look at to see how far we can get with that amount of money. Yes? We have someone answering some of these, uh, writing down some of these engineering questions. Some I can't answer that. Uh, I do know the breakwaters are, are, are set to go out 230 feet offshore. Uh, we'll get an answer to that and we'll post it on our website. <laughs> 